Okay, good morning to everyone. Yeah, uh, Jordi reintroduced me. I'm Elisette Ortega, the r and &I manager in, in SPC Now. And today I will have a talk, it's more divulgative, about HPC in the quantum era, putting a little bit of history behind. But, okay, if the pointer wants to move, maybe I can do like this and someone pass the screen. <laughs> I will do some exercise today. Before I start with my talk, I want to show you what we do in, in SPC Now. So we are located here in Barcelona and we provide services and Turkey uh, solutions adapted to the needs of the customers. <laughs> okay, our company is based in four main pillars. I think that the color. Okay, no, I, I will put just my finger. So the four pillars of the company are planning, where you can uh, contact to us saying, I have this idea of this project on my mind, or I, I have this problem with my cluster, what can I do? So we can help on that. Also, we can take care of the installation of both hardware and software, in the case that you want uh, to install a GPU instrument, you want to install new software, we are there. And we also provide training to let you know how to use all the things that we install. Then we also take care of the maintenance. We have a fantastic support team that is taking care of our customers. Also, we offer managed services. And last but not least is the R&D and I team. That is the one at the lead where we develop some proof of concepts. We are also open to collaboration. We collaborate with uh, some open source projects. We collaborate um, <laughs> with European projects. So they are playing a little bit with uh, the slides. <laughs> Don't touch it, come on. <laughs> and then my favorite part of the R&D team is the technology transfer because you have one idea you're dreaming about that, and the sweetest thing of dreams is when they become true. So that is one of the things that we do here in SPC now. So next slide, please. Someone will pass the next, he's just pressing the arrow to the left. Okay, to the right. So this company is quite young. Today I realized that HPC KP is older than HPC now. So I was born in 2012. The main office is here in Barcelona, but we have another office in New Zealand. And between the two sites, we are defined around 35 uh, people, 32 here and three in New Zealand. Then we don't have, since the beginning, any financial dependencies, all the growth was made organic. And we also are part of the European joint venture called Doing Now that has offices in Montpellier, in Turin, and also in Germany. See? I think algo, no? Ah, está, I have four titles, I have, and I have not turned Okay, so... Now we will start the topic of today. Uh, I will show you how the evolution of uh, computing, or supercomputing, can I explain a little bit how quantum computing is evolving? So I will begin the story saying, once upon a time, see? <laughs> okay, what else? Adelante. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a witch. The witch that you have here in the, in the screen, that is a real computer, is the... Oh, that part has a lot of clicks. <laughs> Click, please. I will put my computer afterwards, so it will stay. Okay, is which stand for Wolverhampton Instrument of the Teaching of Computation of Harwell. So this picture was taken in the in the museum in the museum in London 
by Kenneth Host, one close friend of I, hopefully. So another click, another one, another one. Next. Okay. <laughs> so they start building the instrument in uh, I think that it has not batteries. Uh, in the 15th, they start doing the design. Yeah, no sé qué pasa. And they finish the construction in uh, three years later. And then 20 years later, they get the Guinness World Record of the most durable computer. And it still works nowadays. So it's, they have to make some tricks. It's not usable, not productive, but it still works. So next. Okay, 70 years later, was past year, was published the top 500 list. And the top one was Frontier. So just to come from the which instrument that was one that was doing the same operation that we can do in a calculator or less than the ones that we can do in the calculator of the mobile phone to that one was a difference gap of 70 years. So it's quite big. Next. Okay. Ah, ya funciona? Fantastic. Ah. Uh, sí, sí, lo cojo bien. I think I have to go down. <laughs> we found the maximum range of this one. So, uh, checking the news, the slides will be published in the in the site. You will have here the at the bottom the link. So, uh, 12 years ago, we have the first quantum computing available commercially uh, that was made by the wave That case was an D-Wave 1 that was an annealer, if I'm not wrong, but made it producing flux uh, qubits. Then seven years later, we have the ion-based commercial quantum computer, the first one. Someone in the audience already has told about the different brands and vendors that we have quantum computer. So it's insane the number of vendors that we have, and it's insane the number of different technologies behind. So here you can have, you can see the blue dots, they are already qubits, you can count it. So there are ions that are trapped in a, in a field. So it was in the 2018. I will do that presentation there, I think. Okay, <laughs> then four years ago, IBM get their first uh, quantum computer commercially available. IBM won, if I'm not wrong with the name, I will say yes, so point to me. <laughs> uh, this has another, yet another different technology than the other ones. There was a universal gate base. And past year, we have this uh, first room uh, temperature quantum computer in a supercomputing center. The vendors of that one was quantum millions that they are using center of color of diamonds. So they have a diamond, they remove a carbon, they put a nitrogen, and there is the qubit. And was the good thing of that technology is that they don't need that such amount of cooling uh, power. They can put just in the in the same place where they have the, the HPC. The, the drawback of that is the amount of qubit that they are available is not not that big that the one presented in the first talk. So this is the, this is the short history we have of quantum computing, of the commercially available quantum computers. So let's back to the present to see what we have now. So what we have is that we are still far from reality. So we are improving, vendors are improving the number of qubits, they are improving the error, the, the error rates. They're improving a lot of technology behind. Also the, the technology behind superconductors, behind cooling is improving, but we are still, as you can see, far from the reality. Here I put three pillars. Uh, one is the quantity. Quantity I mean by number of qubits. We are still far to have a, not an acceptable number of qubits because now we can start to work to do some stuff, but to have one that can be really uh, useful for the society. Another thing that we have to consider is the quality. We have qubits, but they are mm, noisy. So we have to, well, vendors at this stage, they have to work to have 
to reduce this noise level, the one that is coming by the instrument and the one related to the measure applying what was telling before, Albert, the logical qubits. And another one is the availability. Today, that is uh, 17 of May of 2023, there is one single quantum computer in Spain. It's uh, less than 15 kilometers away, it's in Sardanola. To the date, maybe at the end of the year that would, would change, but today it's only one. And also, not availability in number of um, quantum computers that we have, it's also availability of the accessibility, the one that we have that is still uh, quite expensive. So, but that means that we cannot do anything with quantum computers because they are noisy, they have not so much qubits, they are not available. Uh, yes, we can use simulators. We can use our own laptops or our own HPC premises to use uh, quantum computers. And I will see you one example. Ah, uh, no, before that, I will show some of the simulators that we have in the available now. There are a lot here in the slides at the bottom. It's in blue, a very, very small, but there is a link to the top 60 three quantum computer simulator of the past year. So I can say that there are more than 100, more than 200, maybe 1,000 simulators available. It's a lot, but just to put some in the, in the screen to ring you a bell. We have a kiss kit from IBM that is the most, the smart, most widely known. We have QLM from uh, Eviden. I didn't fix the, the slide, but it was Eviden was already presented before. Uh, we also have Kibo that was a collaborative effort between uh, Kilimanjaro, BSC and another centers. And also Penny Lane that is from Shenado, that is a Canadian uh, company. So for that, uh, for that four, uh, we, we can take as an example of two of them, Kiskit and Kibo, which, others, spoiler, that can use uh, GPUs to be accelerated. Both can run in one single GPU, both can run in multiple GPUs at the same time, and Qiskit can run also in MPI, taking into account a huge amount of uh, nodes. So let's see one example. So I run one example in my desktop from home. It's not so powerful, it's a Ryzen 5 with 16 gigabytes of memory and a graphic card at 2060, enough to play Minecraft and enough also to do some uh, computing. So I did, I uh, found one example in the bibliography, we will show it later the link, about the uh, calculation of uh, quantum volume in 100 shots. So just to show what is a shot, when we are measuring uh, a quantum computing circuit, we are uh, looking for uh, probabilities. So to have a reliable result, we have to measure a lot of times. 100 is not that amount. So for doing some uh, study by our own to check some, I don't know, some state vector or something like that, we have to run at least 1,000, but if you can run 1 million, it's better. So we have in this chart a green line that is the time that we took or uh, run this quantum volume calculation at different qubits that we have in the axis. And in the Y, we have the seconds in the, in red, we have the time with the CPU, and with blue, we have the time that it took to me to run it in the GPU, exactly the same code. So the adaptation to run the code was just that in the constructor, device equal GPU. It's not that difficult. So there are three spots that we can see here in the screen. We have one at more or less 15, where we can see that the two lines are starting to reverse another one around 25 and another one at the end of the calculation. So what we find here is around 12 qubits. We can see how the, from zero, well, you don't know, from two to 12 qubits, we can see how the CPU and the GPU are having mostly the same performance. This is because my Ryzen 5 computer has 12 threads, six core 12 threads. And starting from there, we can see how the gap is increasing. And increasing a lot. So it's a great advantage to run the code in the, in the GPU. So you can see that for the blue line, 
for 22, 28 qubits, simulation running 22 qubits, 28, sorry. We took more or less 10 seconds from the GPU, it took seven times more. So it's a great advantage using one. And then we, I had to stop uh, adding qubits at this point because my graphic card only has six gigabytes of RAM. And I will tell you about that at the end. So in the case, I only plug one GPU, but what happens if we plug more GPUs? Okay, if we plug more GPUs, what we can have is have more qubits in that case. So this is the same example that I run on my computer, it's exactly the same algorithm. I copy and paste from the paper into my uh, Python notebook. But in that case, they use a, a CPU that I don't know which one it is. It's not in the paper, but uh, they are using a uh, six NVIDIA Tesla V100 that has 16 gigabytes of memory. Or can take care of the state vector of 29 qubits. So here you can see in blue the line of the performance of this algorithm running in, uh, in CPU. We can see that it's more or less linear, I suppose, because we have a lot of uh, memory and a lot of processors behind. And then in green, we have the same line using different GPUs. You can see up to 32 qubits that are, okay, we are using one GPU and the 29. Then we have to add the other remaining five to reach the 32 gigabit, uh, qubits. And then we have to combine the CPUs and GPUs to keep the calculation working because the cards are already out of memory. So, but six CPUs of 16 uh, gigabytes are a lot. Yes, it's a lot. Because when we are using quantum emulator, we have to take care of the amount of memory that we are using. So I'm putting uh, you in that case, uh, in that uh, example, in the worst case scenario. In that case, we're simulating uh, everything. We're taking all the quantum gates. We're taking care of all the state vectors that we have. And this is the numbers that we get. So the memory that we need to store n classical bits in a classical machine, it's n bits. It's like it is. The memory that we need to store n qubits is two, because we have two states, the zero and one, up to n, that is the number of qubits, multiplied by eight bytes, because it's the number of, is the space that it takes to store a complex float, because we are storing a complex number taking care of the, uh, the probability of qubit one of the qubit one instead of the other one. So for example, in that case that we have two qubits on the screen, we have the state zero, zero, the zero, one, the one, zero, and the one, one, and we have to store the complex float result of the four ones. So just to put some numbers, because before you can do the calculation by, by yourself, for, for two qubits is not that big, but the numbers are a little bit scary. In a regular laptop uh, that, we has, that has a gigabyte of RAM, we can maybe uh, simulate 29 qubits. If we are using a good GPU, I think that one of the, the better GPUs that we can use for HPC is the A100 that has 80 gigabytes of memory. We can simulate 32 qubits. If you want to increase the list by two qubits, we have to add four. We have to have four of these graphic cards. And if we take all my Nostrum 4 with all the memory that they have, and we want to run a simulation there, we cannot be bigger than 45 qubits. So it's, it's quite a lot. So now the, taking care of the simulation, okay, we can play with, with simulation, we cannot be so big. But the take home message I have for here is that, uh, okay, we can do simulation, a noiseless simulation in our PC. We have to be patient and wait until we have some results from the vendors. They are working so hard to have that. So I will invite you to don't fall in the quantum hype team. So the people that say that quantum will save the world or the quantum haters team, the one that's saying that quantum is just bullshit. <laughs> then uh, quantum computers are still not ready. will be ready soon. Maybe in 10 years we have something that is profitable by the society. 
But this is not an excuse for you to don't be quantum ready if you want. We have already simulators. And then uh, you can use, you can take a profit of the HPC resources if you want to do an extensive simulation. And we here in HPC now, we can help you to do that. So thanks for your attention and enjoy the HPC knowledge meeting. Thank you so much. We have plenty of time for questions. Okay, I'm going up. Uh, I've seen you have a relation between the memory and the qubits. Do you have kind of a formula? I use the n up to a uh, two up to n plus uh, multiply by eight. Okay. I know that some cases, depending of the simulator, you can have the complex load in the double precision mode, and it's not eight, it's 16. So the memory that you need is bigger, you know. OK, we have seen, and we are going to see a lot more technologies around quantum computing. But there's a commonality on all of them. Every single technology for quantum computing, they do have a simulator. So this, obviously, there is no other way around to get the people upskill and get uh, the people ready just to, to start to use this, uh, this platform. This is very expensive and how to say selective uh, kind of a platform to, to start to, to work with it. Um, so it looks like uh, uh, the simulators are playing a key role uh, at this stage. So do you want to comment a little bit more around the availability of the simulators and the... the ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, we uh, work here in HPC now to make the simulators, emulators in the case, according to the praise definition. It's insane that different definition that we have for simulator, emulator, and all this stuff. Uh, we are collaborating very tightly with a group of university and research centers that are called the EASY, the European Environment Scientific Software Installation. And what we do there is prepare what we call recipes to install the software in the HPC. So one of the recipes, well, one, no. We had a quite a big number of recipes on MIT, uh, on uh, Qiskit. We are working one uh, to do it with the installation of Covalent that will be belonging to the last talk that we have. I think that we have something also for my, my QLM. I was looking if there was any other question in the, in the Slack. No, we're good. So thank you so much again. Andy.